I'm going to talk to you today about my passion, which is DNA. And uh, you probably all know about DNA. Uh, forensic scientists, CSI, they look very cool. Sadly, scientists are not quite as cool as that every day. Uh, uh, testing DNA to determine a crime scene. And you might remember back to your biology classes that DNA is the molecule that uh, your mother and your father gave you biologically. They came together in your zygote, sperm and egg, and they are the blueprint that makes you. And DNA is a remarkable, remarkable uh, chemical. It's a very simple chemical. It's made up of only four different types of subunits. They have long, complicated names, but we give them letters A, T, G, and C. And each one of your cells has three billion of these letters, and that is the blueprint that you started off as an egg. But it's not only your blueprint, it's also oak trees, bacteria, whales, tuna, the things you eat in your sewage, everywhere. Everywhere that there is life, there is DNA. And we now can do remarkable things with DNA. We can sequence it, we can determine its letters, we can manipulate it, we can change it. And that's changing the way we do all sorts of different things. Basic research, healthcare, the way we think about treating ourselves, the way we think about agriculture, and the way we monitor the environment. So what I'm going to tell you about today is really about DNA. And DNA is very much a UK thing. Actually, we're really good at DNA in the UK. So Watson and Crick, uh, back in 1954, uh, using data from Rosalind Franklin, uh, discovered or proposed the structure of DNA. And it was a real revolution because it was a very simple molecule and it was a bit unclear about how this simple molecule could give rise to life uh, here. In, 1990, in the 1970s, Fred Sanger uh, developed the first way of determining the sequence of DNA. And that was the mainstay for a long time until in the mid-2000s, a company called Selexa, based just outside of Cambridge, developed the modern standard way of looking at DNA that was bought up by a US company called Illumina. And these days, this continues. I have a prop. Um, there's a little uh, company, or rather big company now, Oxford Nanopore, that makes one of these, which is a portable DNA sequencer. Now, I'm going to hand this round. It has snazzy man uh, magnets. This is the first version. Um, uh, later versions, I'm afraid, don't have the magnets. And uh, uh, these two pieces here, this is actually the business end of this. This is a massive heat sink and the thing that connects to the USB stick. So I'll let it, uh, the front row have it. Could whoever ends up with it give it back to me? I want my <laughs> DNA sequencer back. Okay, so you can fiddle around with that. So we're still great at DNA here in the UK. So some of the best research that happens in genomics in the world happens in the UK. The UK Biobank, this is half a million people that have been brought together to be studied intensively and their genomes are being done currently kind of on the cheap and probably in the future their full genomes will be done. Cancer uh, and human genetics research is led from here um, and we have probably the biggest mainstreaming process of genetics and genomics into the healthcare service. And in particular, there's the 100,000 Genomes Project, which is Genomics England. The rest of the world looks at how the UK handles DNA sequence and handles DNA information. Finally, my own institute, EMBL EBI, so the European Bioinformatics Institute, we take all the public data around DNA and other biomolecules, we store it and assemble it, and we give it out to the whole world um, for people to benefit from. Um, so that's what we do in our institute. So what are the impacts of this? Well, let me go to a project, again, led from the um, UK, the Deciphering Developmental Diseases Project. This now looked at children who had been diagnosed with a, a developmental disease very often in the first couple of days of life. If you're a parent, you know that before you're allowed to leave, a pediatrician looks at your child. And actually, it's a very visual thing. They look directly very often at the face and just basically say, is there something slightly wrong? They're very good at this. Unfortunately, a small percentage of children do get flagged up then. And previously, what would happen is the doctor would say, well, I think there's something wrong. We need to track this child. And very often, that child would have to go through many, many tests. And also, the parents of that child would be cancelled and said, well, 
quite possibly this is a genetic disease, but we don't understand it. And so you, if you want to have another child, be aware that there's going to be a higher risk of this. In this project, those children and their parents had their genome done. In fact, they're a sort of subset of it called the exome. And now in 30% of cases, the doctors, the geneticists, can come back with a diagnosis. They can say, this is why your child is sick. Now, sometimes that really helps the child. There are some cases where when you know this is why the child is sick, there are some very small cases where there's a transformative drug that you can give the child then and really, really changes that individual's development. But more importantly than that, for even when we can't help the child directly, it really changes how the family reacts to this. They stop having to go to the healthcare service all the time. They stop having to try and find out what is wrong with their child. And furthermore, there's a percentage of genetic changes which just happen in the child. So the parents' genomes are fine, and it was that single transfer from mother to child or, fa or father to child which has caused that disease. And so then the parents can know that they could have a second child with a much lower risk of it reoccurring. We also have uh, work on changing the way we do cancer drug delivery. So there are cancer is a, is a disease of your genome. Uh, a, a cell in your body goes haywire, and it goes haywire in a way where its DNA changes. Now, there's some ways of cancers going haywire where some drugs work perfectly, but only for that type of haywireness, as it were. And uh, by sequencing a cancer's genome, we're able to say this drug will work for this cancer. And it's that very specific marrying of which drug works for which person. This is going to require a lot more data. A lot more people who currently have cancer or will have cancer will need to study their genomes and the drugs that work. But everybody expects this to provide much, much better um, therapies. DNA, we can also use it to improve agriculture. So there's a lot of crops in the world which haven't undergone the green revolution. Um, wheat and rice, we have spent not only our ancestors ages optimizing them, but in the 70s there were very, very intensive programs to breed those crops far better. But there are many, many other crops around the world, pearl millet, pearl millet foxtail millet, cassava, all sorts of other things, which haven't gone through the same breeding programs. And rather than having a very hit and miss approach, which is how you did it in the 60s and the 70s, you just bombarded wheat with radiation and saw what mutants came out. You can now make much more structured crosses and comparisons of plants to deliver a better agriculture. And DNA is present in every living thing. And we, all of our environments, carry the traces of the organisms that are around there. Your sewage plant is not a very exciting thing, but it is a massive bioreactor. Sometimes sewage plants collapse. They stop being able to process sewage. Something goes wrong in the mixture of bacteria that deliver that. Rather than this being a hit and miss process, again, we can study that, look at it, and understand why sewage plants suddenly collapse. Uh, a bunch of rather mad, charming Frenchmen sailed the oceans. Um, uh, just scooping up bits of ocean and sequencing all the organisms and what they picked up. They discovered remarkable things about the way the ocean handles carbon, nitrogen, and phosphate. Now, not by studying it in terms of chemistry, but studying it in terms of the organisms inside of it. So I want to give you one more example. This is an example that, that I, uh, of kind of um, serendipitous science that I was part of. And it starts very British-wise. It starts in the pub. Me and my colleague were sitting down. And we have a big data problem that all this DNA causes all, much, all manners of headaches when we store it. We store about 70 petabytes of DNA, at our of, of DNA information at our institute in um, uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. And so my colleague Nick and I were joking that this was going to get unmanageable. And we were joking a little bit more that actually nature had given us the solution, that DNA was a digital molecule. Remember those four letters? It's a bit like computers, ones and zeros, but it's A, T, G, and C. And on our second pint and over our second napkin, 
we realized that so we could actually reposition DNA as a storage molecule, not for storing information about life, but storing information that we wanted to store, anything that we wanted to store. And there's some tricks we had to get around. You can't write long pieces of DNA. You can only write short pieces of DNA. Writing DNA is a slightly more complicated thing, but it is doable. So, um, uh, and uh, a lot of the tricks there we had to pick up from computer science. It's actually one of the same tricks that your mobile phone uh, uses. So when you make a mobile phone call, it's not one long stream of voice that goes across the airways. It gets cut up into little packets. The packets get sent across the airwaves. Um, if one or two packets get missed, it doesn't matter, and it gets reassembled by the phone on the other side. You don't notice that. It's the same way that your hard drive works and your, uh, the mobile phone memory. Everything gets shattered and then reassembled uh, all the time. So um, after our second pint, our second napkin, we thought that this was a feasible thing. My colleague Nick went over, went off, wrote some code, did this. And we realized that we could really position, reposition DNA as a generic storage device. And then we had to think, when we do, did this for real, what were we going to store in DNA? Now, DNA is a remarkable molecule. I can take DNA, and as long as I keep it dry, it will last in the same form for about 10,000, maybe half a million years. At half a million years, that's longer than humans, modern humans, had evolved. You have to go, you're going back into Neanderthal times uh, at that point. Uh, it's incredibly small. A small little gram of DNA can store two petabytes of information uh, very, very easily. There's also a very interesting trick about DNA. You can copy it. It copies itself if you give it the right chemical bar uh, around there. Uh, and that's very different from hard drives. You can't put a hard drive there, put a bunch of electronics beside it, and say to the hard drive, please copy yourself uh, over uh, using that, that fundamental pieces of electronics. So we realized that we would, uh, but by the way, writing DNA still is expensive. It's an expensive thing to do. So we had to think about what we were going to store the first time. So we thought that we were going to store culturally important things. So one was an MP3 of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, uh, that one day this nation will live out the true meaning of its creed, that all men are created equal. We are scientists and geeks, so we did the PDF of the Watson and Crick paper. Um, uh, we want to connect to the arts, and Nick's father was also a Shakespearean scholar. So we um, did all of Shakespeare's sonnets uh, in DNA. And then finally, uh, we did a picture of our very own institute, Emble EBI, which was a bit of self-promotion. And we made that DNA, actually in California. We shipped it over, and we then showed that when we sequenced the DNA, uh, we could get back the whole... Um, uh, um, collection from that. And it's actually quite a difficult thing to prove because when you show DNA of that size to people, it's just a smudge of dirt on one side of a test tube. And you can hold it up and you say, I have all of Shakespeare's sonics and this PDF and everything else on this tiny piece of dirt on the edge. DNA is an amazing molecule. <coughs> the UK is very good at DNA technology. Um, uh, and innovation, I think, is going to be the future of the economy. And I want you guys to know that we're good at this and it's worth doing. Um, the uh, company that makes that, where is my DNA sequencer? Who has my DNA sequencer? Over there, you're fiddling. That's great. Okay. The company that makes that uh, DNA sequencer, I'm a paid consultant for that, so don't believe everything I say about it. Uh, uh, but the company is um, uh, Oxford Nanopore. It's based just side out of Oxford. And it is a unicorn, it, it meaning that it is a company valued at over a billion dollars in equity, and it's still in private hands. If that company was on the West Coast, I suspect the CEO of that company, Gordon Sangera, would be on the cover of Time now. You would be reading about it and getting really excited and wondering what those crazy guys in the West Coast were doing. And what I just described now about this digital storage method, 
um, me and my colleague Nick are setting up a company to try and exploit that. There are a couple of things which I can't tell you in a TED talk because it's going to be broadcast live about how we think that's going to work. But we're pretty confident that sometime in the future, you will be storing your precious data, not on a hard drive, uh, but in DNA. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd like to get my DNA sequencer <laughs> back. Yes.